You're now tuned in to the Desire to Trade podcast, a show where we bring you the best figures of the trading world and teach you how you can become a successful trader. This is your host, Etienne Kret. What's up, traders? It's in Clarky from the Desire to Trade. And welcome to this episode 63 of the Desire to Trade podcast. This week, I'm really excited for this episode. And the reason why I'm really excited is because I personally use this episode a lot in my trading. I personally took a lot of things out of this episode to apply in my own training, and it really helped. So this is an interview I had with Raman Gill. Raman is the woman behind Trading with Venus. She's done a lot of things out there to help people. She has a podcast, she's doing videos, and she's starting out right now to do more videos. So it's definitely something to check out. There's going to be all the links in the show notes. And by the end of this episode, I'll tell you exactly what is the thing that I applied in my trading that made the biggest difference in the past couple of weeks. But first, we need to go on with this interview, and I'll tell you everything at the end. So help me welcome Raman Gill. Raman Gill, welcome to the Star Trek Podcast. How are you doing today? Very well. Thanks for having me. Well, it's a pleasure to have you on because you're also having a podcast about trading and that I listened to a couple of times. And I really love the topic you have, the interviews you have. So I want to start with what is one call that inspires you? One of the things that I found in life is that things don't always fall into your lap. You have to be ready and prepared for them. So the one quote that I like is the one that's, I think it goes like this, opportunity comes to those who are prepared. So preparation is the key for anything in life, in my opinion. I love it. I love it. So tell us a little bit what is going these days for you. So these days I am just coming back from a month long holiday. I've been uh, traveling around Canada and a little bit of uh, United States, just taking some downtime, uh, time away from charts and just getting back into it these days, this week, actually. Cool. You didn't do Montreal, no? Didn't go to Montreal, no, but I've been there many times. <laughs> Sounds good. Sounds good. So... We often ask the guests here on the podcast, how exactly do you start to trade? Because people often have a long way when they start to trade to go to successful. So how was that story for you? For me, I came to know about trading through a friend of mine. I was running an IT consulting business at the time. So my background is in computer. I have a computer science undergrad degree. And I had my IT business that I'd been running for some time. But a friend of mine came to me and said, hey, this great opportunity that pays you 80% return. And my husband said, that's a terrible idea. Don't get involved in that. And he's a banker. So he's like, I don't know anything that you know gives you 84% return. But she's like, no, 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 this is great. So I put $10,000 in it, invested in this company, and I would get these statements that looked really nice. You know, Every month, there's, you know, my account balance would go up. And then I find out that the company got audited by SEC and they shut down and there goes my money with it. However, along the way, I got really interested in this thing that would give me 84% return. And I started bugging her, uh, asking her to teach me about trading. And of course, she was just a beginner. She didn't really know that much about it in terms of being able to teach someone and in starting to do the research. So I started finding courses and mentors out there to learn how to trade. And that was the beginning of trading for me with losing money right off the bat. Mm -hmm. And then what did you do after that? Did you come to a point where you had to find education or did you just go on your own and try to find your way? Um, actually, no, I tend to just go find a course. I, I like to go find help right off the bat. I've tried doing things on my own. I'm not the best do-it-yourself person. So I went and I think one of the first courses that I took was Rob Booker. I know I went to Seattle. I flew to Seattle and took a weekend course with him. And from there, since then, I've taken several courses. Some of them have been good. Some of them not so good. And out of all of that, I must have spent thousands and thousands upon uh, you know, learning. Um, and of course, I was looking for Holy Grail throughout this time. And at the end of it, I just came up with something that works for me. Mm -hmm. and do you think that those investments you made, even though they were pretty expensive, were they worth it in the end or could you have done everything yourself? I think it's very difficult to do something like this. So I went and actually did an MBA as well. And in my MBA, I went to Cornell University. So in my class, I had this guy who actually was, you know, sat right beside me. He was pension fund manager. So he managed a huge pension fund. 
And there were a couple other people who were in the trading field. And I, I sat with them and I talked to them. They were all in doing MBA with me. And I found that it's hard to learn everything on your own. They go through some fairly rigorous training. And I have, I've worked in the bank for many years as well. I have talked to traders there. And the training that they put them through and the stuff that they have to go through and read up on the research they have to do, I think it's very difficult to do it on your own. So understanding like the economic concepts, right? Why is the market moving? And then learning how to do technical analysis. I suppose one could do it on your own, especially with, you know, YouTube and a lot of free things being available on the internet. The only thing that I find that is missing throughout that would be the step-by-step process. Just, you know, where do you start? I remember when I first started trading, this was years ago when I first moved to Toronto and I started trading full-time. So I set up my office at home and I didn't have kids at the time. So I took up one of the rooms in my condo and set up my system and I would look, come to the charts, wake up in the morning, come to the charts, look at a technical level, and I would place a trade. I had no concept of what else was going on in the market. And this, is, this was me trading full time, right? And I had a decent sized account, but I didn't know what was going on in the market. So all throughout the U.S. when they were doing quantitative easing, I was actually buying the U.S. dollar. I'm like, oh my God, that was terrible. <laughs> Just not understanding the markets. And so you were trading full time at that time, right? I was trading full-time at that time, although since then I did go back to not trading full-time for personal reasons because we were trying to start a family. But at that time, yeah, I had sold my business, I had moved to Toronto, and I had taken the money, some of the money out of that, and I was trading full-time. Could we assume that you started to trade full-time a little bit too early, or was it justified in your opinion? Uh, No, it was justified. I had been trading part-time for three years at the time, and I was profitable. I had, I think, when I was trading part-time, I had about $10,000 account and I was, pro- I was seeing profits as out of that. And I had developed some consistency in my trading. So I thought, okay, if these are the returns that I'm getting on my own, just trading part-time, if I take it full-time and really focus on it, I should get better results. But I didn't realize how many things I was missing. I just didn't see the blind spots at the moment at that time. Mm-hmm. And what kind of traders are you these days? Are you more like so what is your style? What is your time frame, And what kind of market are you trading exactly? So my focus is mostly on currency. So I trade, I'm a Forex trader. I have dabbled in um, gold and oil. I used to trade gold a lot before. However, right now, even though I do once in a while, I, take, I will take trades in those markets. Those are not my most active asset classes. Mostly it's Forex trading. And I would define myself as a hybrid trader. I started off being highly technical. I would only focus on technicals. But since then, uh, with my background in economics and all of that, I tend to look at like the business cycle. I tend to look at what's going on from fundamentals perspective. So every morning I've developed this process where I do an overview of the market just to kind of get the lay of the land. And then I jump into technicals. So I would say technical slash hybrid trader. Mm -hmm. And what kind of time frame are you trading? Is it day trading specifically or? So I get my market direction from the daily charts. I look at how the daily candle closes for each pair that I'm trading. And then once I have established a bias for the market, then I go into a shorter time frame. So I look at four hour, one hour, 15 minute. And to enter a trade, I go to a five minute chart. Hmm. So it's really so multi time frame. It's multi time frame. So basically, for the higher time frame, I'm looking at the levels because the support and resistance levels at those at the higher time frame gives us higher probability trade setups. But to actually get into the trade, I am trying to basically get the most pips out of it. That's why I just like to get really close in terms of my entry. Mm-hmm. And are you mostly looking to trade trends, or is it mostly sideways, or or are you doing both? You know, I started off as a, I, I was not trading trends. I didn't even understand how to trade trends in the beginning. And I was always calmed counter trend. At this point, I still have a little bit of bias to counter trend, but I do mostly it's trending markets, but I'm comfortable trading counter trend as well. Hmm, that's great. And one thing that 
I realize with this kind of analysis, when you go with multi time frame, is that you often have to be there to watch the price, right? So if you're looking to buy, let's say at the specific level, you have to be there. Is it something you think you have to be there at the computer often, or do you put alerts or any other strategies to remove yourself a little bit more? I put alerts and I do my preparation the night before. So I'll take a look at the daily candle and I develop a bias. And during my preparation, I look at what level I'm looking to trade for the next day so that when I come in the morning, I already know, kind of have an idea of what I want to do for that day, which is really helpful. I found that process to be really helpful. But in terms of, I am a day trader. I consider myself a day trader. I get very uncomfortable and I think it goes back to personality. I don't hold my trades on for too long. I like to close them that day or the most I'll hold them for a week or so. So for that very reason, I tend to be at my desk and I have reduced my trading hours substantially. Actually, I only trade Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays. Now I take the Monday off. I found my success rate on Mondays hasn't been that great just because, you know, the way the markets tend to be. And Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursdays are the most profitable. And sometimes I may trade Fridays if it's trending nicely. Otherwise, it's just the three days. And what does your schedule look like? Is it the whole day or is it only the morning? It's only the morning. So I trade from, I'm trying to convert it in Eastern time. So basically, I trade from 9 a.m. Eastern to about 11.30. Although I am going to go back to trading the London session, which is my favorite session to trade. I used to trade the London Open. And since I've had kids and so forth, it's been really difficult to get any sleep. So I haven't done that in a while. I'm going back to that this fall now. So what does that look like for you? Are you going to have to wake up in the middle of the night to trade it? or? Yes. And that's been the problem, waking up in the middle of the night. So I was in Toronto. um, So Eastern time zone, I used to wake up at around 2.30 a.m. in the morning to catch the land. (laughs) And now I'll have to do 12.30 a.m. here for mountain time. So we'll we'll have to see how that goes. I'm going to give that a shot. So if you had to kind of choose between the lifestyle versus trading, do you trade for because you have a passion or is it mostly because you want to have the lifestyle? You know, I wouldn't stay with this as long as I have through the ups and downs. If I didn't have passion, I am, uh, I love trading. I'm uh, very, very passionate about it. So one of the things I tell everyone who's interested in, you know, becoming a trader is that it's not an easy journey. There are easier ways to make money. And there are, you know, when I worked for a corporate, in a corporate job, it was much easier. You got paid every, you know, every biweekly, you got the check. And there was no problems with that. You know, it was coming. However, there's just something about trading, just that freedom. And you can make a lot of money in trading as well, but it's a learning curve. It takes time. And then we go back through those ups and downs. It's not one of those things where, you know, you learn something and then you're perfect at it. You're not because we are all human beings. Emotions come into play and then uh, markets change central bankers make decisions that impact all of us. And so, you know, it's a bit of a windy road. It has been for me. It has, and I've seen that it has been for a lot of people. So it's not a quick get rich, quick scheme, or at least I haven't found it to be, but it's beneficial. So I I am a full-time trader and it does allow me the space to do other things in my life. I can, uh, you know, spend time with my kids, follow my other passions and that sort of stuff. So It does afford you a good lifestyle, but it's not the only reason. It's not the first reason I recommend someone chooses trading. Yeah, totally agree with that. And what would be some of the mistakes you've made in the past? Let's say the worst mistake you've made. Oh, man, I have made every mistake under the sun there a person can make. But the worst mistake would be holding on and not understanding the markets. The example that I've given you before, where while the Fed was doing quantitative easing, I was actually buying the US dollar and that would have been perfect time to sell the US dollar. So I just didn't understand how one interest rates impact the market or how things like quantitative easing, what impact they have on the market. So just the lack of knowledge around that proved to be very, very harmful to me. And then I compounded my mistake by actually 
risking too much. So my risk parameters were just way offline. So I always tell people, start with a small size, small size account, manage your risk. Because I didn't cut my, I didn't have a stop loss on, I just let it run. You know, and the small mistake just got bigger and bigger and I lost thousands of dollars. So I took, I think I started off with a $25,000 account, took it to in four months or so and to $100,000. And then I remember this Euro trade that I closed out with $25,000 negative. I just can't believe, you know, like things like that. That was just risk was off the chart. So risk management I have learned is the most important thing. And what is one thing you've done through which you saw a big difference in your trading, like a big positive impact? Creating external accountabilities for myself. I have found that when you work for a business, some a corporation, there are accountabilities put on you. So you have managers, you have other teams, other members of the team that you're accountable to. You have deadlines. You're supposed to do things by certain time. So there's a lot of built-in accountability in the system. And when you start trading on your own as a trader, you have none of that, right? So you have to be self-motivated. You have to be able to set your schedule. You have to have your, create your own development plan. There's no manager sitting there with you and, and saying to you, okay, what are you going to, you know, how are you going to grow this year? So all of that, you have to be very, very disciplined and self-motivated. And I was never any of that. I, I was, I've always been rebel- rebellious, never like to follow rules. And I've gone through a lot of pain <laughs> as a result of that. So I find that creating external accountabilities, like finding a trading buddy, for example, is good. Then I came up with a process that I do every morning. I look at the market the exact same way every single day. And this goes against the you know, my grain uh, because I'm not one to follow rules. But I have learned that if I put structure around my trading, I become more successful. And that's what I have gone and done. And I've, I started teaching as well. And I find the more I teach, the more I learn. So it makes me a better trader. So a lot of times I get these comments from people, hey, you know, if uh, you're so successful or if you're making money, why do you teach? One, I feel like at this point in my, you know, age, I don't want to give up away my age, but <laughs> at this point, I feel like I do want to make a contribution. Some of the things that I have learned the hard way, I do want to make it easier for others. So I came as an, you know, immigrant, like seriously, I could not afford to buy Coke. I would save the money for bus fare. I could not buy, I would not buy a can of pop because I didn't have any money in my pocket. And going from that to the current place where I have, you know, a decent lifestyle, I'm comfortable. I can't say I am, you know, gazillionaire because I'm not. However, it's a comfortable life. I can afford to have a decent size account and do this for a living and follow my passion. So I've been blessed in that sense. So now I feel like I want to give back. I want to give back some of those lessons that I've learned and also Teaching is something that I've always been good at. It's not something I always wanted to do. But now I find I enjoy doing that. And the more I teach, the better trader that I become myself as well. Now, it's pretty interesting because I wrote a post about especially learning and how to learn and how to make like a strategy a habit. And teaching it is a really powerful way to do it. So teaching people is really, like in my case, probably the best way to, to learn. You know... I absolutely agree. And one of the things that I've done a lot of research on is the scientific process or behind learning. And one of the ways a person can accelerate learning is exactly that, what you're saying, teaching it to someone. And I've recommended this to several people. Just go teach it to your friend, you know. And it's something that I'm trying to incorporate into my kid's life as well, where when they come from school, I do ask them, okay, what did you learn at school today? Right. So it just helps them process that information because in trying to explain it to somebody, you have to really get the subject matter. And if let's say they're not able to explain it to me today, they know I will ask them that question tomorrow. So it just kind of creates that loop where now they have to pay more attention in the class. It was one of the strategies I used to use when I was in school. I grew up in, in a boarding school and I remember there was this physics exam in grade 11. We all failed the midterm. Every single person in the class failed. And that's really when I started this whole teaching by learning because 
I thought, okay, I couldn't sit at the book and learn by myself. Our teacher wasn't all that good. And so I said, I would go to the board and I would learn something. I would learn a concept. And then I started teaching it to my friends. So all the whole entire group of us passed as a result of that. But that was my first kind of foray into teaching or learning through teaching. And I found that to be very, very helpful. So I totally agree with you there. Love it. And going back to the accountability subject, because I know people are making excuses about that. They want to have accountability, but they, they said they know no one that trades or no, no one that can be accountable to. So what have you done to be accountable to someone? Is it because I know people use sometimes their husband or their wife to be accountable to. They give reports or something about their training. So how do you do it exactly? So I have tried that, being accountable to my husband. It sucks. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> it just doesn't work because he will ask me. And when things are not so in, going so great, I'll be like, well, stop picking on me, you know? So, <laughs> and he doesn't want to do it anymore because he says, well, we'll just get into an argument. And, you know, so, yeah, so that may not, may or may not be the best place, depending on whether your spouse or partner even understands, uh, understands trading or is interested in that. One of the things that I have done is I, first thing I did, was I started a meetup group, right? So I was looking for someone else to do this. I couldn't find it. I thought, okay, let me just go start a meetup group. So I started, you know, gathering people and doing that. Another thing that I've done is I have started posting my goals on my Facebook account, <laughs> my Facebook page. So every, I haven't done it for this month, but every month I go in and post my goals for the month on my Facebook page. So everybody who's in my friend circle will see my goals. And then that's one, you know, type of accountability that I've created. And then I have also gone to my friends and said to them, okay, these are my goals for the month. And these are my process goals as well. So um, there are things that I like to do in the morning. For example, I like to do meditation and I tend to do walking meditation or visualization. I found it's just a good way to get started in the morning. So I will write that. I will create a calendar. I have a little calendar in my office where I put a check once I've done that. So I will then share that with a friend and say, okay, this is what I want to be held accountable for. And this is what I'm going to do. So I find there are different ways of doing that. I started doing my daily analysis calls a couple of years ago or one year. I think it was two years ago. I just got a bunch of people together and say, hey, let's do our analysis together. You know, and I was the one who always did the analysis just because people don't want to do it. So that way it just helped, you know, every step, you don't know how it's going to help, but I found it's been, you know, throughout the journey, it's been very beneficial. Speaking of goals, could you give us a few examples of what goals you would have and are they really process based or are they like monetary based? I, I have moved away from maybe not completely. I do have monetary goals. So I am looking, for example, 10% return on my portfolio for the month. And then I'm also, so that's a bit aggressive. Generally, I found a 2 to 5% return on your portfolio is pretty good. So 10% tends to be quite aggressive. So I just like to have a goal that makes me work for it. And then I have process goals about doing my preparation the night before, for example. That's a process goal that I have for myself. And I have a check mark for that. Did I do that for that day? You know, then doing my daily market review. So once the market's closed, I like to take a look at, okay, what happened that day? Did the news come out that really threw everything off? So even though that's after the fact, it's a review, but it prepares for you for the next time something like that happens. And what do you say to people who say 2 to 5% is like too little? I want to have like 20% per month. How do you respond to them? You know, I think, well, in my opinion, that's unrealistic. So I have learned, I have looked around and that used to be my goal to, oh, I want to double my account every month. And I have done that. So in the beginning, not in the beginning, when I first started trading full time, I had great returns, but then I was taking on way too much risk, right? So at this point, I've learned that I don't really need to take that kind of risk. It's a business investment uh, or trading is a business just like any other business I have. I do real estate as well. I have investment properties. So I won't go and look for a multi-million dollar property if I don't have the down payment for it, right? So whether that down payment is coming from right from my own account or from investors, I need to have a certain amount of down payment 
so that I can go and buy that property. So it's the same way we can't have a $500 account and then think that we're going to make millions out of it. In my experience, that's unrealistic. I mean, look at the banks. What kind of return are they giving us, right, for our money? 1%, you know, if Mm -hmm. you're lucky. So we can certainly do better than 1%. So I I think, you know, doing 50% to 100% a year is okay. But if you're thinking of doing it every month, like doubling your account every month or every few months, I think you just have to take more risk. So if you're wanting to more take more risk, when I have done that, I've done that several times. Like I have grown the accounts really, really quickly. But what happens is it's hard to maintain that. It's hard to be consistent with that. So now I'd rather go with the consistency and free up my mind space because I used to go through a lot of churn. I would, you know, shoot up in terms of profits. And I still go on winning sprees. Like so there's sometimes when the, oh, just the trades, I'm like over 95% a winning rate. It's just great. But that's when you're on a roll and then you start hitting speed bumps and then it could go complete the, completely the opposite way. So we just need to balance that out. So we're not going from, you know, the top of the mountain to deep in the valley. So just max or maintaining that balance as a professional trader becomes very important. I love it. And what do you think people need to succeed in trading? I think one of the most important things is coming in with realistic expectations. So not being too greedy, not expecting to kind of turn your small account into millions overnight. So realistic expectations are very important. So I recommend people go and look at what other successful traders are doing, right? So how are what kind of returns would somebody working at a prop trading firm get? So looking at some of those like actual financial institutions or prop trading firms, what are those, what kind of returns those traders are getting? And then, so having realistic expectations based on that and just understanding that this, like anything else, you have to develop the skills for it. We can not just say, sometimes I've heard people come and say, oh, it takes that much work. Well, it does, right? So that's why having that passion for it is also very important because it takes a lot of work to want to learn it and then stay on top of the markets. And I want to go back to something we talked about a little bit earlier, which is you said every single morning you look at fundamentals. Mm -hmm. So what kind of fundamentals are you looking at? Because of course, they don't change so often, right? You're going to have news and you're going to have releases sometimes like a few times in a month. But Mm -hmm. what are the things you look at? So my process that I look at every morning is first thing I go to Forex Factory. So just understanding the news that's coming out for that day, because the news can change things drastically. So market may be going down, news comes out and it completely changes direction. So that is the first thing that I look at, especially the red news, the The major major news. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't trade during the news. I've had bad experience where I remember I was 60 pips in profit in one trade. And at the time, I just traded through the news and I got out 20 pips negative. So I called my broker and I said, what the heck? How did I go from? And I had a stop loss, like I had moved my stop loss to 40 pips or something, right? So I was, no matter what, according to me, I should get out of the trade with a profit, at least 40 pips profit. And it turns out the broker said, there's nothing they're going to do about it because there's slippage during news and you're going to slip. And I said, well, slip that much? You're going to slip me 80 pips? I said, that's just how it is, right? So that was just one of those experiences where after, you know, learning the lesson a couple of times, I said, okay, no more trading during the news. So that's one of the things I look at, the major news. And I try to understand what the news comes out as. Like, for example, if the interest rate gets cut, right? I like to know if the interest rate got cut so that I can go in that direction of the news. So that's something that I look at during the, or in the morning. And then I also look at Reuters and Bloomberg. I just want to get a feel for the market. So I don't look at like CNN or anything because a lot of that is hype or opinion. Even with Bloomberg and Reuters, even though it may be opinion, but it still gives you an idea of what's going on, like what uh, the stories that they're reporting on. Just I focus mostly on the currencies and macros or fundamentals around the currencies. So I found those to be helpful. 
And then I go to the news feed. I used to subscribe to, it was called Talking Forex at the time. So now a lot of brokers offer that news feed free of charge. So I go and look at the news feed. So they give you just a, basically a summary of what happened in the London session, for example, when I'm training in New York. So you get a feel for what's going on. And then they'll uh, a lot of times comment on some large orders that may be coming into the market, that sort of stuff. So I, I like to know where, what those levels are, where those orders may be coming in so that I can build that into my analysis. Pretty detailed. It's a little bit more than I do, but it's, it's pretty good. I love it. So what else would you like to tell the listeners of the podcast? What takeaway should they get from this episode? So the most important thing that I would say is patience. Just like anything, like learning to drive, it took us some time. It took me a long time. I, tried, I started learning driving a standard car. I still don't drive it too well because I quickly switched on over to automatic. But you know, when you're first driving, you go through a lot of like, you can't focus on everything that's going on while you're learning to drive. You have to change gears. You have to pay attention to your left, to the right your rear view mirror, where you're going, all of that. But over time, that becomes second nature. And today we can, uh, you know, I can put makeup on while I'm driving, <laughs> but uh, you can eat a burger and you could be talking on your cell phone. You can do, you can multitask while you're driving. So it becomes autopilot. Our subconscious brain absorbs that information and makes it available to us. So that's exactly what we have to do with our trading as well. And one of the tricks we talked about accelerated learning is that if you do your preparation at night, it gives your brain time to process that information so that when you wake up in the morning, time, brain has had some time to digest it. So your retention or you'll see improvement in your results as a result of that. Interesting. So how can people find you? They can go to my website, www.tradingwithvenus.com, or you can do a search for me on, on the YouTube. I have a lot of videos where I dissect particular trade setups. I'm mostly a price action trader. I have tried indicators. Most of them haven't worked for me, or at least they're, you know, I haven't figured out how to use them profitably and consistently. So I've gone to reading price. So I will... Um, do a lot of videos every week. I do a weekly analysis. And then I also do webinars every other week. I do a free webinar where I pick a topic and I talk about it. So that information can be found on my website, tradingwithvenus.com. Pretty cool. And the podcast too, right? Oh, yes. Podcast. There's Trading with Venus podcast. It's uh, available on Stitcher, iTunes, and I still need to put it on Google Play, which will be available later this month. And actually, why don't I use this to make another announcement? I guess you have a, we'll do that right now. I'm putting another podcast together where every day I'll be taking one trade setup and dissecting it. So it'll be video based. So I still have to figure out the logistics around it, but it will be released later this month. Pretty cool. Interesting. And I was going to ask you, what kind of goal do you have for the future? So that's one of the things is doing the podcast, the video podcast. And another one is I have been approached by a hedge fund to potentially trade for them. So they are just going through their funding phase and all of that. So um, hopefully that will come through. So that's the next step for me. So I'm fairly, I'm very excited about that. And what's your main motivation to do all this? I really just love trading. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. So Raman, I'll have one last question for you before I just want to remind you that all the show notes are going to be in this So If people want to find the links we talked about, all the resources we talked about, it's going to be on this artitrade.com. And the question, the last question we always ask the guests is if you could give only one piece of advice for traders in one sentence, what would that one sentence of advice be? So my one sentence advice would be, don't be greedy. Greed has killed more of my trades and profits than anything else combined, everything else combined. I love it. I love it. Raman Gill, thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's been a pleasure to have you here. Well, thank you very much for inviting me. Really appreciate it. Awesome. There you have it, this interview I had with Raman Gill. Now, to stop the suspense here, the thing that I applied in my training that made the biggest difference from this interview is the idea of preparing myself the day before. I used to always get up in the morning, prepare myself, and start to trade. And that was fine. But now I decided to try things a little bit differently. 
and start to prepare myself the day before instead. And that alone made me a lot clearer about exactly what I was supposed to trade for that day. Now, it's not a big change. It's not something that is difficult to do, right? Everyone could do it. And that's the power of this. You could prepare the same day or you could prepare one day in advance. It's easy to do one or the other. But if you really want to send out, you have to be willing to try new things and you have to be willing to put new things in place. And it's going to feel weird at first. Like the first days of trying this, I didn't feel super confident. I felt like I didn't know how to plan the day before. But when I saw the clarity I had in the morning, the next day, I was amazed. And that's the part of trying new things because you really see at this point how much you can improve. And implementing small things like that in your own trading, in your routine, is what's going to set you up for success. There's nothing else. There's no big change you can make today to make like a million tomorrow. But there's small things that you can implement over time, one by one, little things that are going to, over time, make a huge impact. Right? This, is, this is what we call the compound effect. When you start with one thing, you add another, and then another, and then another, and you end up with a big thing, a big change, and that's powerful. So I hope you took something useful out of this interview. If you have any questions, check out the Facebook group. Connect with me there, desiretotrade.com forward slash group, and I'll be sure to answer your question. And we always do this live training q and on Friday. I want to bring the best value there, and I really want to do something to help people out there. So check it out, and I'll see you in the next episode, episode 64, then, of the Desire to Trade podcast. Ciao. Thanks for listening to the Desire to Trade podcast. To get all the information on this show, free articles, and unique resources, make sure to check out www.desiretotrade.com and subscribe. Please leave us a review and let us know what you thought about the show. It's time to become the best trader you can be. See you next time.